um, is a, a BBC Radio Norfolk presenter. You're, I heard you this morning on The Breakfast Show. Um, so he is currently uh, delivering the, bre the Breakfast Show. And you will also know him if you're a footy fan, because he will present, he will do the commentary for, is it just for the Canaries that you do it for? Uh, mainly the Canaries, yeah. I've, I've dipped in and done the odd other team here and there. But yes, mainly I do all, all the Norwich City games. Okay, good. And the reason I, I, I happen to know Chris, but I'm not going to say any more than that, I, I knew him when he was 16 and he was first starting out in his career. So I do know that. Do you remember me from those days? I, absolutely, I do. Because, <laughs> when, because when, you know, when you say those days, obviously, it's not that many years ago, is it? Not yeah. that many years ago. Not, you know. Oh, okay, all right. it, was, so, it was only five years ago. It's yeah. only about five years ago, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. I'll go with that. I'm just <laughs> Just gave it all away. So I, I knew Chris uh, as a 16 year old, as you know, the, the, stu the students that we're trying to, to address now and and um, and starting out in his career. So he's going to tell you all about how that all went and and also give you some mind, some pointers as to, as to where to go next. Over to you, Chris. Well, thank you very much, Diane. Look, it is nice to see you again because, um, yeah, as you hinted out there, it has been a, it has been a terribly long time. I think we, we, we had some dinosaurs to contend with. It was that long ago um, when I last saw you. Um, but uh, Diane will be popping up later on in, in the, the story I'm going to tell you, which is how um, I got started uh, into the job that I'm doing now, which, as Diane said, I've got was a one job in that I work for, for BBC Radio Norfolk, but I, I do two jobs uh, within that particular um, organisation. So, yeah, I present the breakfast show Monday to Friday mornings. Uh, we're on the air six in the morning till 10 in the morning. And then during the football season, uh, whenever Norwich City are playing, I, I commentate on, on their matches as well. And that's where I would I should start, really, with, with Norwich City, because um, I've always been a Norwich City fan. Um, my dad, my granddad, the, the Gorhams, uh, going back years, are all from Norfolk. I'm a Norfolk boy through and through. And my family have been Norwich City fans going back and back and back. And I am uh, going to give my age away now because um, in 1985, when I was just about three, uh, Norwich City won the League Cup. And that was when I got my first ever Norwich City shirt. And I've still got it now. There it is. I don't know if you can see quite how tiny it is on me, but I was three years old when I got this shirt. And probably my dad knew what he was doing. He thought, if I get this, if I get this lad a Norwich City shirt at the age of three, then he'll have to be a Norwich fan. And I was. And I used to go to the football all the time with my dad and my grandparents. And, and I loved it. And uh, it got to the point where you know, football was the thing that I loved doing. I loved watching football. I loved playing football, but I wasn't very good at it. In fact, I was so poor at playing football um, I didn't even, I wasn't even able to get in my school team. So it, it was quite clear to me at a very early age that if I wanted to to make a living out of football, it wasn't going to be playing it. And um, I then spent a lot of time watching football on the TV and listening to it on the radio as well, because uh, when I was about 10 or 11 years old, um, the Premier League started. Uh, it used to be called um, the first. Sorry if you can hear a noise behind me. That's my dog scratching at the door. So Bertie the dog wants to get in on the end. So you can hear me talking. There he is, celebrity appearance from Bertie the dog. Look, he wants to get in, just if you wonder what that noise is. There he is. Go on, Bertie. He's, he's hot. Um, yes, yeah, so when I was about 10 or 11 years old, um, I, the Premier League started, and the only way that you could follow it was um, on the radio if you didn't have um, a satellite dish and, and Sky TV when that first came in. So I used to listen to a lot of football on the radio, and whenever uh, Norwich City were playing uh, away from home, and obviously I wasn't able to drive, wasn't able to travel by myself. I'd, I'd listen to, to the football commentary on the radio. So I, I worked out at a fairly early age that there's a career here and that you could actually get paid for watching football, which was you know, a massive dream of mine. And, and it was at that point I thought, well, that's what I want to do. And I, I knew quite early on, really, when I was sort of 13, 14, that this is the career I wanted to aim for. And I know not everybody gets to that age and knows what they want to do. And, and that's perfectly fine. But for me, I, I, I knew I wanted to be a football commentator. Um, and so I looked into how you became a football commentator. And it's a strange job, really, because if you've ever looked in the job section of the newspaper or you've searched online for jobs, you'll see it's a job that you never really see advertised anywhere. So it, it, there's no clear path into how to become a football commentator. So what I did, I got to the age of 16, did my GCSEs, and then you have that that, that really awkward time in your life where I know a lot of you will be about oh, what do I do next you know because you, you've not only known being at school and, and what that's like and then suddenly you've got these decisions to make about which path you take and I think one 
word of advice that I would give you is that you can't really get it wrong. You can whatever decision you take now isn't going to you know, define everything. You can always change direction later on because of the people I work with. We all work together at Radio Norfolk. I, I don't think there's two stories that are the same as to how people ended up there. So, yeah, that there's a it's, it's a, a long and winding road that the road into radio. But I knew it's what I wanted to do. So when I finished um, my GCSEs at, at Sprouston High School, um, I looked into you know, what else could you do to actually get a bit of radio experience? How, how do you actually you know, step inside the radio? It's all very well hearing these voices coming out of the radio. But how do you get in there? How do you become one of those voices? And that's where I first met Diane, actually, because um, I found out that you could volunteer and you could work at a place called um, Hospital Radio. Uh, and there was one in, in Norwich. There still is. Uh, and you can go along and you can just get a bit of radio experience. They have a proper radio studio uh, and you can volunteer. You get to mainly my first job was to go out onto the wards of the, the hospital, the old uh, Norfolk and Norwich, I think it was then, uh, and take requests from people of the, the, the songs that they wanted to hear, the songs that would you know, cheer them up while they're in hospital. So you now as, as a 16 year old, it was quite a quite a daunting task to go in to a hospital ward when people weren't very well and ask them what sort of music they would like to hear but most of them were just really pleased to talk to somebody and to to know that somebody was thinking of them so you'd then go back with a list of um, people's names and, and and requests and favorite songs and you'd then get the chance to play them out uh, on the radio so that's how I first learned how to operate a, you know, a radio studio, how to work the desk, how to play records I mean it's mainly CDs in, in those days and and how to work out what to say and, and how to speak into a microphone um, and th that was a really important step having that that voluntary work having that bit of experience really helped me further down the line because uh, when I was 16 and having done my GCSEs I decided not to follow most of my friends into sixth form at Sproutston High School I went off to Norwich City College because they did a and they still do very special specialist media courses so I did that for a couple of years and while I was there, I was also doing hospital radio with Diane and, and many others. Uh, and then um, I got the chance to go along to BBC Radio Norfolk, the station that I work at now, uh, the station that I'd always listen to because of their Norwich City coverage. And I sent them a letter. because um, I don't think we had emails. Then I certainly didn't have access to emails. And I said, look, I'm really keen on football. I'm a Norwich City fan and I've been volunteering at hospital radio. Can I come in and see how you do your sport shows? And they're always after keen people who, who are willing to come in so they invited me in for a couple of Saturdays and I literally started behind the scenes on our Saturday afternoon sport program making cups of tea for, for guests making cups of tea for the presenters a chap called Matthew Gudgeon who I, I still know who still works at Radio Norfolk now uh, did that for a little while um, and he, he then said but you, you you're clearly keen you, you you clearly want to do this and, and he then allowed me to go out and cover a, a local football match for the first time now this was before I was able to drive so um, I had to get my, I had to ask my mum and dad nicely one Saturday in the winter uh, if they'd mind driving me to Great Yarmouth. And, and it was a January Saturday afternoon and Great Yarmouth Town were playing uh, Ely City in, in a fixture. And we went along, it was freezing cold and I was given a mobile phone. And again, it, it, this, I know this sounds like uh, ancient history, but we didn't all have our own mobile phones in those days. So you had to go into the office in Norwich. And you had to get, get given a mobile phone, which was about the size of this uh, of this notebook all told at the time and it had a really big battery pack on it and you were then sent off to you know various local football grounds to when it was half time in the Norwich City commentary you would then come on and talk about how Great Yarmouth was getting on but you know the mobile phone signal in in Norfolk then and in Great Yarmouth then was was even worse than it is now so I remember the, the first time I ever did a full-time report uh, about Great Yarmouth I think winning um, I had to do it not from the football ground, but from the side of from from the lay-by in the A47 near the Acle Strait on the way back home because it was the only place I could get this phone to work and, and get a signal. So that that was a strange introduction, but I loved it. That there's such a, a buzz from being live on the radio, and I, I knew then that this is definitely the job for me. So I I was doing that on Saturdays uh, at Radio Norfolk and completing my um, media course at City College. Um, then I was 18. And again, decision time. And it happens a lot when you're you're in your teens. You get another decision to make. And when it's 18, it's do you go away to university or or do you get a job? Do you try and find a different qualification? What do you do? And again, most of my friends went away to university, but I didn't. I thought, well, th the point of going to university is to get a job. And I've sort of got my foot in the door here. I'm doing a bit of work at, in, in the station I want to work at. I'm covering football. If I go away to a different city, a different town, 
and university, I've, I've, I will lose that and I'll have to try and get in somewhere else. So I decided to give it a year, not go to university and just see how I got on. And I don't know whether I should be telling you this because, of course, uh, education is always a good way forward. But that was actually one of the best decisions that I made, because in that year I hung around Radio Norfolk a lot and was invited to cover various shifts because they, by this time they knew me. Uh, they'd begun to trust me. They'd begun to realise that I knew my sport, knew what I was talking about. And I was gathering little bits of experience all the time and gradually started to fill in for people when they were on holiday and you'd get a, a week's work and then maybe you'd be asked to do another job. And, and that's how it started, really, all snowboard from there. And eventually I got taken on in around the year 2000 on a, on a full time contract and, and I've been there ever since. Um, in terms of university, I'm not saying don't go to university because that, that's a very poor piece of advice because most of the people that I work with did go to university and did do you know, one degree, two degrees, you know, whatever it might be. It will, it's certainly not going to harm your employment prospects. But what I would say is if you don't feel the university is for you or if you end up going to university and you don't enjoy it or you don't get what you want out of it, it's not the be all and end all. There are other ways. There are lots of people I work with who, who didn't go to university and have, are doing you know, perfectly fine in, in radio and in, in lots of other walks of life as well. So having worked at Radio Norfolk on a voluntary basis and then um, picked up the, the, odd bit of, um, the odd bit of work here and there, um, I, I then joined the sports desk full time, which meant doing sports bulletins during the week, going out and interviewing various Norfolk sports people, Norwich City managers at the time. Uh, and then I, I, the thing I always wanted to do was football commentary. And there was a chap called called Roy Waller who was doing the football commentary at the time. And I got to know him and, and he was really nice to me. And he, he knew that I wanted to do his job effectively. And he let me sit alongside him for a few games. Um, I then sort of became the presenter of the programme, so would hand over to him to do the commentary. And when he was ready to to retire from that job, I was in a position to be able to step in for him and, and take on the microphone on, on Norwich City match days. And in fact, the first ever commentary I did was a, a game at Carrow Road and Norwich City were playing in a pre-season friendly. And it was in the summertime. It was a day like today, actually, really hot, really sunny. And the, the game had, had just started. My little stint of commentary had just started. It's the first time I'd ever done it. This was it. This is my dream job on the radio. And after about three minutes, uh, of, of football commentary, there was a massive thunderstorm. And because this was not a proper match, it was just a friendly, it wasn't a Premier League match, it was a match that didn't really matter, the referee thought, well, we don't need to be out here in this. And he took all the players off the pitch, like they do in the cricket. So suddenly, within three minutes of my football commentary career, I had no football to commentate on. And I was just left with a microphone and nothing to talk about other than the rain that was falling. So that, again, that was a, a huge baptism of fire. And um, I remember Roy sitting next to me and just looking at me and laughing because he knew that I'd been thrown inadvertently right in at the deep end. Um, but I managed to get through it and I loved it and became the, the main Norwich City commentator when, when Roy was ready to, to, to stand down and, and retire. Um, the trouble with being a football commentator, and I found this out pretty quickly, is that it's often that that fills your time for one day a week maybe two days a week during the football season because you know, Norwich City are only playing on a Saturday and maybe once during the week. So you've got to find something else to, to justify your, your your wages the rest of the time. And and I'd gradually been asked to stand in for other people on their programmes and, and present some programmes while they're off because, again, I'd been around for quite a long time by this point at the station and had earned the trust of the management and they let me present a few programmes. And so it got to the point where I was presenting programmes during the week and then at the weekend, I was um, doing the, the part of the job that I really loved and, and becoming a football commentator. And that, that's sort of where I am now, really. I do Monday to Friday, the breakfast programme, uh, which uh, is a great show to do because it's the time that most people listen to the radio. So a lot of radio stations will always make the breakfast show their, their big focus because they know that that's the time of the day where people have got the radio on because they're going to school, they're going to work, they want to know what's happening later in the day. There are other distractions. People sit down in the evening and watch TV, don't they? It's not quite what it was because, of course, there are lots of other distractions now and uh, people don't rely on the radio so much for their news. They've got their phones, they've got um, internet, they've got other ways of doing it. But breakfast shows are still, by and large, the time when most people are listening to the radio. So I do that. Th that's the upside of it. The downside is it involves getting up at four o'clock in the morning, Monday to Friday. So I do that. Uh, I go into our studios in the Forum in the centre of Norwich. Uh, and uh, present that six until 10. And then during the football season at the weekends, um, I do um, Norwich City commentaries. And that involves going to Carrow Road when Norwich are at home, 
uh, or it involves when Norwich are away, sometimes from very early starts, lots of motorway miles, driving to the away games, uh, doing commentary on the matches, interviewing the manager afterwards. And it's not just a fact of turning up and doing it. You've got to know your stuff because you're, you're talking about um, players that, of course, the listeners can't see. So you've got to describe what, what's going on so that it's as if they're there, so that they can follow where the ball is on the pitch. And you've got to fill in a little bit of extra information because you have to realise that not everybody who's listening to you is is a huge football supporter. So um, whenever I'm doing a football commentary, I do a couple of hours worth of, of homework on it. And these are the notes that I'd write. Uh, let's get a good look at that. I'm going to adjust a bit anyway. That, that, that's the sort of notes I will do on on this side for, for every football commentary that I'm doing. You'll notice it's um, all written in pen. Um, part of that is because uh, I'm I was sort of the last generation to come through without you know daily access to, to computers in the classroom, so I'm not quite sure how to set things out accurately on a, on a computer. But also a good revision um, technique for anyone who's got exams coming up. I really find that by being online and researching footballers, but then writing it down myself, it, handwriting it down, I find the information really sticks. And quite often I can remember things without having to look down at, at the notes, which is quite good when the, the match is, is happening in front of you, just having that in, in the back of your mind. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's part of it. You've got to turn up with that in front of you. Once the team is announced, then I move on to this side and uh, write out the formation and where people are playing. And then down here, as the game's unfolding, the, the writing's really scruffy because that's where I remind myself who scored the goals during the games. And this is a, there was a lot of writing in this one. This is a recent game towards the end of the season at Norwich, won 7 0 against Huddersfield. So I had lots of goals to write down and to remember what order they were scored in. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's basically what I do now. Along the way, there have been lots of other opportunities. So I was lucky enough in, in 2012 to spend some time at the Paralympics in London. Um, I got a job working for the BBC there, uh, which I, I wouldn't have had without all of this experience at Radio Norfolk. And, and they put together a, a team to, to cover that for all of the local radio stations. So um, I spent uh, the summer of, of 2012 actually working on the Olympic Park and, and covering the Paralympics, which is a brilliant experience. Two years later, I did the same job um, up in Glasgow for two weeks for the Commonwealth Games. And I've also spent um, one year I did, um, I was asked to work at Wimbledon. So covered Wimbledon for the whole fortnight, which has been brilliant. So having had this great ambition to be a football commentator, uh, actually, that's where I have got to. It's taken a long time to get to where I want to be. But along the way, the attempts to get there has led to lots of other opportunities coming up, lots of other people asking, oh, do you fancy doing this? Can you just stand in on this show? And I found that you know a really good lesson for me has been to be open to these things and, and to quite often say yes to things that you didn't ever think you'd, you'd find yourself doing. Because hopefully it'll go well and you'll enjoy it and you'll find out you've got uh, a knack for something that you didn't know you can do and you'll enjoy something more than you ever thought you would that's if it goes well if it doesn't then these things only last for so long and at least you know then that you don't enjoy it so it's always worth trying these things out no experience is is ever wasted if, if somebody comes along and says do you fancy doing this do you fancy having a go at this even if it's something you've never thought of doing and i, I never saw myself as as a you know a radio presenter uh, but the, the job that I'm doing now, the the, the breakfast program is is a news program. We we do the, the big news stories of the day. We we interview, uh, for example, today's big story is about a new road. Um, I don't know whether you've heard about it, but the a new road being approved to the west of Norwich. And so you've got to interview politicians, local politicians. You get callers who ring in who have got very strong feelings either way, and you've got to be across all of that as well. So it's it, what I like about it is, you know, no two shows are ever the same. Tomorrow morning we'll be talking about something. Look completely different and I'll have to spend some time learning what the issues are around whatever's in the news tomorrow so yeah th th that in a nutshell is how I got to where I am now the biggest change I've seen has been in technology I mentioned at the start that um, I started off with that massive mobile phone well now um, I do all of the interviews really when I'm out and about when I'm recording I do on on this that's all I use now it's amazing just an iPhone now to do interviews and if when Norwich City have played I take this to the side of the pitch. Um, it's just an iPhone like you would have. Uh, we've got a couple of special BBC apps on there. I plug a microphone into it like this, just into the, the charging point at the bottom, do the interview and stand by the side of the pitch. And next season, we're lucky we're in the Premier League. So you can stand by the side of the pitch at Old Trafford or Anfield and you just send the interview back and it drops into a computer in, in our studio in Norwich and they can put it straight out on the radio. Whereas when I was first covering Norwich, you would record on a big tape recorder, physically have to record it, and then you'd have to run back to the, the point that you're broadcasting from and you'd have to play it 
back down the line by pressing play on it in real time. So, I mean, the way that technology has moved on has been been incredible, really. Um, we do a lot of our radio interviews now like this on on Zoom or on Teams, that there was a time when you were relying on, you know, until quite recently, really, you were relying on somebody having a very good mobile phone signal or being able to come into the studio to see you face to face. But over the last year through COVID, we've found out, you know, like a lot of people, many different ways of doing things. It's not been safe to or considered safe to have people into the studio with us. So we do a lot of our interviews now like this um, on, on the radio. So, yeah, that, that's always changing. And anyone who's looking to get into broadcasting now, um, well, you've got amazing opportunities to, to hone your skills and, and to try it out and, and see what works for you. Because the only way that I could get any real broadcasting experience was again, going with Diane and, and working at Hospital Radio Norwich, whereas now so many people are getting into the industry off the back of their own YouTube channels or off the back of their own social media feeds, uh, writing about football like that, talking about football like that. You know, many people don't even need a radio station or, or a TV station to employ them. Some people are able to get a following on social media and able to start their own things and beca can become sports journalists, very good sports journalists, very talented sports journalists in their own right without having to rely on an organisation like the BBC or, or ITV or Sky or whoever it might be to employ them. So, yeah, if, if this is if broadcasting is something you you want to have a go at, you think you would like to do, well, that there is nothing to stop you because now you do all you need is a phone, um, a little bit of confidence because you know you're not going to be brilliant at it straight away probably, and you will get people, especially now. I mean, I'm I'm very fortunate i consider myself very fortunate now that things like social media were not really around when i started commentating because I, i'm sure i wasn't brilliant straight away and it took a long time to, to hit my stride and i was spared the what we get now is when we make a mistake on the radio people are very quick to tell you because they can tweet you during the game uh, they can text into the radio station and if you get something wrong on the radio you immediately see text messages dropping in into our system at work from people telling you so you have to have that that little bit of thick skin you have to be prepared, I think, if you want to work for an organisation like like I've just mentioned, you've probably got to be prepared to do something for nothing to begin with, to show that you've got the, the, the passion for it, to do it on a voluntary basis, because TV, radio, whatever it might be, it's one of those industries that lots of people think they want to work in. Lots of people like the the idea of the bright lights and, and the glamour of it. And there is that side to it. I've, I've had some wonderful opportunities, as I've mentioned, but there's a lot of... Um, sort of compromised along the way, such as the antisocial hours. You know, one of the things that, I'm, that I ha have accepted is that I want to be a football commentator. You know, there's always football on Boxing Day. So I will always be working on Boxing Day because there's bound to be a game. So that affects your Christmas. It affects your family's Christmas. You know, most weekends of the year when, and I had this certainly when I was growing up, uh, over weekends when my friends were getting together, they were going out, they were going to things. Actually, I had to say, well, I can't come because, um, you know, we've got, I don't know, we've got um, Preston away on that Saturday and so I'll be on the road. So you'll find if it's something you really want to do and you've got a genuine passion for it, that will get you a long way because there are a lot of people who think they want to work in football broadcasting in particular, who think they want to be reporters on the radio or on TV. But when it comes down to realising what you've actually got to sacrifice to do it, they they, they sort of fall along the wayside and, and they don't perhaps have, have as much passion for it as they thought. So... That really would be my, my main word of advice is to try anything, give it a go, um, practice doing football reports, writing them yourself, reading them out yourself on camera. You don't have to show it to the world. You don't have to put it on YouTube, but you do get the rather galling chance to listen to yourself back, which is always a difficult thing. You never quite sound like you think you do. You never quite look like you think you do. But now with all the recording equipment that you can have at home on a computer, on your phone, you, you don't have to wait for somebody to give you that chance. You can go and write your own football reports. We've got the Euros starting this week. If you're watching an England game um, and you think you want to be a football reporter, watch it. Why not? Then write yourself a little report afterwards and, and try and reflect on the game and, and work out how you do it. So th that is a, a good means of, of sort of finding your, your, your feet and deciding whether you think it's the job for you, really. So that's the sort of outline of where I am, how I got to it. So um, if anyone wants to ask any questions, then then do fire away. I'll, I'll have a look at the chat. And uh, if anyone wants to come on, put the hand up and we'll, we'll get you on camera. But if anyone's got any questions about football, about radio, about broadcasting, then then ask away and I'll, I'll do my best to answer. As far as I'm seeing, it's all looking fairly quiet. Diane, I don't know whether you've got any questions at your end. I always have questions ready. Uh -huh. See, somebody... Oh. I 
Hi, Chris. Um, Hello. Hi from All Saints. I've been listening to Charlie. Charlie has got a, he had a few questions, but you have um, answered a lot of them as you've gone through. So thank you very much. It's so interesting listening to you. I'll let Charlie ask his question. Hello, Charlie. Um, where do you see Radio North at? Sorry, could you just repeat that? Sorry, I didn't quite pick up the end of it. Uh, would you see Radio Norfolk offer work experience? Ah, that's interesting. Work experience. We, we do get asked that a lot. Um, that, that's something. At, at the moment, it, it doesn't because you know we've got COVID. So uh, at the moment, we're we're still very strict. I'm I'm not working in the office all of the time. At the minute, I'm literally only going in for the program and then going home and doing all my preparation you know, from home. So at the minute, we're not. I'm sure at some point we will again. Um, it has changed over the years in the work experience. They did used to offer an opportunity to go in and sit in on different programmes and work with the news desk for a day, go out with TV for a day. But what we've got now, um, and this is worth looking up if you're, you're interested in radio, we've, we've got a thing based at the forum called BBC Voices. Uh, and that is a, a a scheme that is designed for, and I wish it had been around when I was you know, your age, because it is brilliant, that they do a lot of work with local schools, with local colleges, and they... They give people an opportunity to, to learn their craft, really. They they even uh, produce lots of programmes that go out on the radio now as well. We have um, a new music show called BBC Introducing. We have lots of youth programmes now that all come from a group of, of volunteers. Uh, we've got a couple of BBC staff members that run it, but it's called BBC Voices. And once things are up and running again, I'm not quite sure what the situation is with them at the moment in terms of whether they're taking people on at the moment, but they've, that they, some of the people that are working with us now have, have come through from BBC Voices, started working on a voluntary basis. There's a chap I, I used to work with called Jay, Jay Lawrence, who, um, started like that he was a student at the university of east anglia he wanted to get into radio he came along spent some time with bbc voices he's now gone through radio norfolk and he's working on national radio at, at absolute radio so and, and so it's again it's just as as much as i said earlier on you know education is important it really is but just that bit of experience that you can get along the way any experience you can get if you can turn up to an employer and say you know i've got these qualifications but i've done this bit of work i've, I've spoken on the radio i've recorded myself i've done some films that there's no substitute for that really that's the sort of thing that's going to give you an edge when it comes to uh, perhaps applying for jobs so yeah have a look at bbc voices um hopefully you'll be able to find the information online if not um feel free to drop me an email um it's my email address i'm happy to give out it's just chris.gorham at bbc.co.uk so if anyone's uh, wants to um uh, wants to uh, ask about that then if you've got any further questions i think of later feel free to drop me an email um is that right charlie yeah. Excellent. Hopefully we'll see you on, on BBC Voices at some point then. Uh, a question here from James who says, can you do journalism apprenticeships with, with the BBC? Uh, I believe you can, yeah, that there are uh, apprenticeships within the BBC. Um, oh, Diane's just put my email address on the chat as well. So if you didn't get a chance to um, to, 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 to write that down, it's there. Uh, th there are apprenticeships within the BBC. They do change the entry criteria. They change the way they do them fairly regularly. So there is a BBC Jobs or BBC Careers portal, I think it's called. You'll be able to find that online, BBC Careers, and, and that will set out exactly what you have to do to apply for, for things like this. Um, it's great. You know, if you can't get in anywhere with the BBC, I'm obviously going to say this, I, I can't recommend it enough. But but don't forget, you know, there are lots of other news organisations now, news websites, other radio stations, other TV channels who are always looking for, for for people who are keen and, and would probably offer similar schemes. So as much as I'm here to bang the drum for the BBC, and I, um, it's a place I know I'm lucky to work at, don't forget there are other options. There are so many radio stations, so many broadcasters now who who would probably offer similar schemes. So, so have a look around. There are, there are lots of people that I work with now who've come from other radio stations or other, you know, other TV channels, other newspapers. Uh, so I hope that's all right, James. Di uh, Diane and then Ruby, are there any A-level courses that would be best suited to a career in journalism? Um, that's an interesting question, Ruby, because in some ways there, there are media courses that you can do and they're great. Uh, they're, I, I did one and you know, I did it at, at sort of A-level. Um, I'm glad I did because it gave me some real practical experience of, of um, you know, recording things and going out and interviewing people and making programmes. But actually, when you think about what journalism is, any course that you've done is, is going to come in handy at some point because 
to, to be a journalist, you don't just have to be an expert in radio. You've got to have a bit of knowledge about all sorts of things because, you know, I gave you the example this morning. I was interviewing people about, you know, building a new road. Um, we're also doing a story at the moment about a sponsorship deal that, that Norwich City have, uh, have got themselves involved in. So one minute you're talking about uh, you know business story, one minute it can be politics, it can be you know how you decide whether to build a road. So actually, whatever you do at A-level, at some point is going to come in handy. So I would say if there's something you've got a passion for, if there are, if there are subjects that you fancy doing at A-level, then absolutely go for it because it will all come in handy at some point. Um, again, what qualifications you do are not necessarily the be all and end all when it comes to working in media or working in radio. As long as you've got some qualifications, that's great. They're, they're all going to count for you. But it's that little bit of extra experience that you've got or you can get if you can show you've done a bit of volunteering. BBC Voices, I mentioned, hospital radio is still going. I know it's difficult at the moment with, with people taking on volunteers, but those are the sort of things. So, again, um, I, again, what one one piece of advice I would certainly give is that I remember being you know, 16 and then being 18 and having all these options in front of you and being told that you've got to do this and it's a really important time of your life and you've got to get this in this exam. And yeah, it is. It's, you know, it, it's, it's certainly important that you do your best and you get the best results you possibly can for yourself. But I've certainly seen through my experience, certainly my friend's experience as well, that actually what you do doesn't define the rest of your life from there. Things change so much and you'll have an opportunity if you, change your mind about what you want to do further down the line to specialise then. So don't worry too much about which courses you're doing at, at this age. Just make sure you're doing something that you you enjoy because you know it's, if you're not enjoying your schoolwork, if you're not enjoying the, the, the work that you're doing, the career that you have, everything feels so much harder. So yeah, just just back yourself, back what you want to do and it will all come in handy at, at any point, I would say. And don't, don't tie yourself up in knots trying to do what you think is the right thing because you know, a lot of the time, you'll do that and you'll you'll find you're, you're perhaps not in the position you hope to be at the end of it hope that's all right ruby uh yes th thank you ruby um anybody else anyone else got any questions anything you'd like to know i know it's a hot day and everyone's probably keen to get out and enjoy an ice cream and make the most of the sunshine aren't they diane but if you <laughs> chip in diane feel free well i was going to nip in with one because i do i know it's important to have one up your sleeve <laughs> um, and as you were talking, what 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 you you because I remember you doing this with Radio Norfolk, and really you could argue that partly, especially when you were going on Saturdays, um, and you were doing it all for nothing. It was all it was all free of charge, and you were just doing it to get the experience and to, and to keep your name up. Um, really, you could argue that's the equivalent of an internship which which happened yeah. would you say are there still those sorts of things out there not just at bbc but in in the media and in journalism where you could go and and i mean these says i think there, there might even be a little bit of payment involved but just going and, and working for nothing is that still going on it, it is yeah there are i think the rules have tightened up a little bit and, and one thing i would say is that you've got to be a little bit careful that people are not just using you as, as cheap labour and are not just giving you jobs that they don't want to do and just saying, there you go, you can go and do that. We won't have to pay you. you you've, you've got to be a bit careful. But in my case, certainly, turning up and making tea for people on a Saturday afternoon, going out and covering the odd football match you know, for nothing, you know, it wasn't for long. It was for a few months that I did that. And it showed them that actually, you know, actually, this guy does want to do this. He is serious about joining the radio station. And for me, it has paid off. So I, I, you don't want to get yourself in a position where you are working for several years, you know, for, for free, and you're not getting anywhere. That that would be wrong. But I think you do need that bit of experience. You get that dreadful chicken and egg situation where, you know, you apply for jobs. And one of the things they always list on the, the, the job requirements is having some experience. But how are you supposed to get that experience if you can't get the job in the first place? So if you've got an opportunity to, to do a bit of volunteering even for, for an organisation, a charity like Hospital Radio, it, it, it's, you know, it's a really good way of finding out what you enjoy doing w without being, you know, having that pressure of, right, you're being paid for this, so you better deliver. So, yes, again, have a look around. It, it, the world like this is changing all the time. There are various opportunities coming up. Um, sometimes companies will find that they've got a bit of, bit of money, a bit of a grant to do something special. So if broadcasting is your thing and, and you're in Norfolk, 
actually we've not got that many organisations here. There's Anglia TV, there's BBC. Um, I mean, there used to be several other radio stations that were based locally, but they're not so much now. Um, there's Future Radio for anyone who's you know who's able to get to Norwich. That they are uh, another organisation based in the north of Norwich that does take on volunteers on, on a regular basis. So, yeah, it, it's a balancing act. Certainly, if you can show you've got that passion, you're keen to do something, you'll get the experience. For me, that works really well. But you know, I know there are some industries where it, it's slightly frowned upon, you know, employing people for nothing for long periods of time. So you, you've just got to have your wits about you a little bit with that, I would say. Um, I've just thought of another question. Um, Sorry, it's, been, it's, it's a bit of a personal one, but oh, when, I, when you, when you <laughs> <laughs> no, don't worry, it's nothing, nothing awful. But when you first came to Hospital Radio, what really impressed me about you um, was your sheer determination. You knew what you wanted to do and you knew how to get it and you were going to do it. You were, you were, you were, I just remember that complete commitment that you had from that time. It was, it was quite something for a 16 year old. That was quite something because, you know, I'm, I'm an ex teacher. I, I work with 16 year olds a lot. Um, but I just wonder if at some point in all that time that you've taken to get where you are now, there was ever times when you suddenly wondered if it was going to happen or you were, you wondered if you'd made the right decision? I think inevitably, yes. Inevitably, you have days at work that don't go, particularly at the start, that don't go to plan. I mentioned earlier on, you, you end up taking on little tasks that people have asked you to do that you haven't thought about, and some of them you'll enjoy, and some of them you won't. And you'll have days where you think, oh dear, this, this isn't what I thought it was going to be like. Uh, and, and yeah, there certainly have been, been moments like that. And again, you know, I'm Yes, getting to the age of 16 and you know, knowing what you really want to do and, and wanting to get there is, is great. You know, that, that that's fantastic. But it, you don't have to. You don't have to get to the age of 16 and know that's where I want to be. I know there are so many people I work with who have done other things, have had other careers first and then come to work in radio. And in some ways, that's a better route in because you've got more to you've got more life experience. You've got more to talk about on the radio. You've got. You know, more to bring to the party so yeah nothing's ever wasted but I, I i know that maybe i was a bit unusual in in knowing the job that i wanted when i was 16 L lots of people um lots of people don't and, and that's perfectly fine as well gain has got to disappear don't worry gain um uh, for, thanks for for, for uh, sending in uh, that you're you, you've got to go and, she, and she'll catch up on the recording she says but yeah uh, nice to nice to meet you virtually gainer so yeah that, oh, that's all i'd say is that you know just because i knew what i wanted to do some people do some people get to 16 and think yeah that's what i want to do some people do do and then find out actually they were wrong and and they're not really cut out for it or it's not the job they thought there's, there's nothing wrong with getting to your mid-20s your mid-30s all of that and um and 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 suddenly realizing that actually you want to do something else um you know my wife's recently retrained as a fitness instructor you know it's, it's not the job that she did to begin with but she's loving it so she's now working for a, for a really good local charity doing that so you can you can absolutely have have more than one career the world has changed so much in terms of the opportunities that are out there the way technology works so over the last 20 years it's you know it's very difficult now to, to to say that you're going to be doing one thing for your life and I suppose Diane one thing that I'd worry about now is that if the old radio business did ever fall, I, I don't have anything else to fall back on because I've never really done much else. OK, uh, did you see the note, the message from Carla? Uh, oh, yes. Charlie agrees with your comments. He, he said everyone starts at the bottom. Yeah, I, I suppose they do. It's a good way of putting it, Charlie. You do have to, you know, in some ways you have to accept that, really. That, And I, I, we've had a few people who've you know, turned up on a Saturday afternoon at Radio Norfolk over the years and have thought, right, I'm going to go, going to be covering Norwich City now. No, you're not. It doesn't quite work like that. You have to be around for a long time before you get that opportunity. And, and some have, have have not made it through and others have. You know, all, all of the people that I work with now on a match day, and they've all joined since I did. Lots of people have found their way through and, and things evolve and, and change sometimes very quickly, sometimes very slowly. So, yeah, you, you've got to start somewhere. And, and that's a really good way of putting it, Charlie. And I think there's another message coming, so just wait for that to come up in the chat. Um, and just, just a, anybody else got any questions they would like to ask while we have Chris? That's Charlie and Carla just saying thank you. That's nice. Oh, um, no, thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Carla. Yeah. Lovely to meet you both. Yeah, thank you. 
Okay, it says, if I can't see any other questions, um, what I would like to do is, is oh, hang on, Ruby's, Ruby's typing. Uh, so we'll just see before I get into this. But um, what I will do is just summarise a couple of the key points that I've picked up from what you've said, Chris. And uh, one of the things that I've, I don't know, I wholeheartedly agree with them, but hang on, what is she going to say? Oh. James, uh, James has just passed Thank on. You James. Thank you, James. Yeah. Um, one of the things was you said that you need to be open or be open to opportunities, even if it's not exactly what you want to do. Um, so that if you have an opportunity to get on with something, try it out, do it and, and gain from the experience no matter what. It's, it's quite good. It's all that Ruby's still typing. So oh, here she goes. There you go. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Thank you. That's all right, Ruby. That's <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing that I've taken from this too, I mean, there's a lot, so much that's been good. So thank you for that. But the other thing that I took from it too is, is in, in answer to the question about the A-level courses, is basically do what you enjoy doing that you will, you know, especially if it's a two-year course or even longer, do what you enjoy doing and do it well. Mm. Uh, that, that's, I think that's really important. And it's, I, I wish somebody had said that to me at the time because it, it, whether it's choosing your GCSE subjects, your A-levels, whatever it might be, it, it always feels, it's made to feel sometimes like this is the be-all and end-all and you're making decisions here that will affect the rest of your life. And yeah, okay, you know, whatever results you get will be on your record, they will. But, you know, it, it's, you know you're know you still only what, 18 when you finished your A-levels, aren't you? You've, you've, you've still not really joined the world of work. You haven't, you probably don't know what you want to do. You don't know what the world's going to be like. You haven't got that experience. So, you know, expecting to commit yourself at the age of 16 or 18 to what you want to do and going into these you know specific courses aimed at jobs it's not it's not realistic for everyone and i think you know you're, you're at work or being well you're at work for a long a long time a lot of your life aren't you so finding something that you enjoy doing i, I think is is absolutely vital I, I think for me having a job that i i'm lucky you know having a job that i really really enjoy doing i i, I just can't that, that would be my main piece of advice really I think I know you've got to pay the bills and there'll always be responsibilities along the way that you've got you've got to meet and of course you have but if you can do that and you can get a job that you enjoy doing my goodness it makes life so much easier I did have a, a job for a while uh, just as I was sort of getting going in radio where I worked in a, in a shop in Norwich it's a shop that's not there anymore and I was based in the stock room and it was oh it was tedious I used to dread it the, the days dragged and actually having that experience yeah I don't paid me a little bit of money when I was growing up but having that experience made me realize that I you know I, I want to do a job that I enjoy I that that is something I'm going to make a priority because you know working days and many people find themselves in situations where they're doing jobs they don't enjoy and you know working days can can feel very long if you're not enjoying yourself so certainly if you've got a passion for something it's something you enjoy doing you know, there's always a way of, of turning it into something even if it's not exactly what you've got in your mind you can always turn it into something it's, okay, I'm going to just put the video on so because we can we can draw this to a, uh, to an end. But um, and I'm I'm just conscious that um, you just said that you've got up at four o'clock in the morning to do the yes. breakfast. <laughs> so you have been up since four o'clock this morning. I have. Yeah, I have. Um, yes, and and I I, I wasn't going to say this, but I I am just going to do a cheeky one because uh, you know of course there's going to be a vacancy on BBC Breakfast coming up. Well, so well. Obviously, I wouldn't know that because I'm on the radio at that time. So, <laughs> so who knows? <laughs> but what I must say is, is a big thank you from everybody um, who has been on the call itself, but who will also be listening to this uh, through the recording. And and this has been very helpful indeed. And um, and we we really appreciate you giving your time. And well, share yeah. your experience. All I'd say, just to finish with Diane, if I may, is that you've been kind enough to put my email address up in the chat. It's chris.gorham at bbc.co.uk. If anyone is watching this later and wishes they'd ask something or think of something later, do drop me an email. I, I can't promise I'm that good at replying straight away, but I will do my best to get back to you. And if I don't know the answer, I'll try and find it out for you because, you know, I've, I, I know what it's like. I've, we've all been there trying to work out the path forward the next step how you get into the world of work so I'm, I'm happy to offer advice you know where i can and, and to put you in touch with people if possible but obviously everything's a bit different at the moment because of of covid and hence the work experience answer earlier on yeah it's true but actually the this team's thing um has helped us to do things that perhaps we couldn't have done so easily 
Mm, absolutely. So, so there's been a, a, an upside. I mean, it's not great, but it, 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 to go through the rest of it, but this has been an upside. So we appreciate this very much. Thank you. Let you go Thank now you. to your family. And um, you <laughs> thanks to everybody else.